Hello, everyone. Since this is either a highlight, a standalone book, or the first episode in a series, I'm jumping in to remind you what the rules are for this podcast. First rule is no real people stories. That means that any details from our own lives are merely anecdotal. We do not read books about real people, and we are not reading historical fiction. The second rule is that we are basing our analyses off of how the author treats characters and what they put them through. We are not judging the accuracy of the trauma, the accuracy of any actual conditions that may be portrayed, nor the authenticity of a character's reaction to that trauma or that particular condition. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The hosts are not trained professionals, and their opinions come solely from personal experience. In this episode, we discuss fictional depictions of trauma and violence that may not be suitable for all audiences. Please take care of yourselves. Specific content warnings for each episode can be found in the show notes. Events in the media are discussed in approximate order of escalation. This episode contains spoilers. Today we are talking about The Midnight Bark by C.L. Polk, a story about personal autonomy and being held responsible for dismantling the systems that benefit you by oppressing others. Hi, I'm Nicole. And I'm Robin. And today on Books That Burn, we are discussing The Midnight Bargain by C.L. Polk. Let's get into our factions. We have Beatrice Claiborne, Harriet Claiborne, Father and mother. I'm sure they have first names. We could not find them when going through this. They might have them. Is Beta Levon, Ianthi Levon, Nadi, Clara, Bard Powells, and Danton Maisonette. All right, so we're going to talk about the circle. The seamstresses are two of them we, that we know of. Um, so as a group, in case they didn't stick in your head as the circle, uh, they did not for me. They did for Nicole. Um, this is the presumably network of um, lower class sorceresses, um, lower and probably lower and middle class who get each other out and get up to things that we don't see because this book is focusing on the upper class. But the contact between those strata is rather dramatic. If you wanted to talk about that a little bit, Nicole. Yeah, that's that's one way of putting it. So, uh, this group of of women are not all seamstresses, although that is one of the professions that they use. They are a group of women who have perf- they're a group of of lower class, specifically women, who have professions that, much like beer brewing and seamstress work, um, in European history allow you to kind of get out of the obligations of marriage in this world kind of functions in a very similar way Um, but specifically these are women who have these professions because they are mages and they don't want to lose that access to their magic so they they have a whole system of codes and a system of like passing on information to the to themselves and to each other and suddenly these two upper class noble women <laughs> show up in one of the shop and ask to essentially very visibly vanish and run away to be with them who exist in secret and in silence and their entire livelihoods depend on never being noticed as people <laughs> Uh, it is a wild, you can see in the reaction in the books, initially they're turned away, they're told we don't know what you're talking about, and when they just come out and say, like, no, we know, and here's all of the things we know, and we just need your help, and I think, I know, I think it was Yasbetta actually threatens to, like, well, you know, if you don't help us, then we'll tell other people, like, I think, or I think it was her, it was one of the two of them, and, and the other one kind of goes, no, we shouldn't do that, don't even, don't say that. But there's this threat of, like, these two noble women showing up can undo their entire world. And they just, you know, and then there's the thought of, like, well, if these two noble women could find us, who else? 
<laughs> um, and it's uh, it's it's just a a very high tension moment, and the the writing really like makes it clear that like this is not a thing that just happens to them all the time. Like they probably get people from who who come in and ask every once in a while but not people who are as as high visibility and high in the social strata as our two two of our main characters and yeah it's it's just it's one of those things where the last thing you want as a secret society of oppressed people (laughs) is to have somebody walk in with connections to everybody who you don't want to notice you and demand to be seen Especially when they say we figured out because of which trees you had planted. Yeah, especially when we have decoded your secret signals and that's how we know. Then it's like, oh no, well, who else can do this? And um, and and kind of, you know, the good news from our story is like, for our main character's perspective at least, is that eventually they actually do get help from these women, but it's incredibly like third party and it's it's very clearly a here you know we don't want you to be discovered because you could compromise us and so we can't do anything directly but here have a have a have a small piece of of some of whatever we can possibly give to you that without outing ourselves oh and um, a thing that i just thought of um the grimoire code that led them to all this in the first place mm mm-hmm. That wasn't made by upper class women. No, would be, not at all. Sh- like it, it was not. And so, yeah, like they are specifically not. like we're introduced to it as Beatrice's mother encouraged her to learn um, codes and code breaking on a uh, heavily implied so that she might find out some of this. Yeah, because I don't think why we... else would she have encouraged it? Like, I think they have a conversation that dances around acknowledging it, but doesn't yeah. like literally lay it out. Do we know Beatrice's mom's background? Didn't didn't uh, her yes. dad marry under his station, so to speak? No, or what, did she no. marry under hers? She married under hers. She married under hers. Okay, yeah. So he was upper class, but not as well off. Uh, and, uh, okay, there, yeah. there's a, one of the, one of the descriptions I do, I do love in this book is that, you know, her, her father had discovered as many men do that the way to, uh, win a small fortune at gambling is to start with a large one. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that was, I, I don't remember whether the quote itself literally said men or not. They're yeah talking about her dad, but yeah, yeah, it's a good way to have a small fortune after gambling. Um, and that, as it particularly pertains to, um, her father, yeah, he, he keeps having ideas for ventures, but he is not good at whatever they are, or he is impulsive, or, you know, he, in, he basically was in this world's version of the tulip bubble. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like literally, that's what it. It's orchids in the book, but that that's that's what it is. Um, yeah. And anyway, probably talk about him a little bit more when we get to talking about Beatrice specifically. But yeah, like her mother was very upper class, and would it is unlikely that an upper class woman would have been part of printmaking to be involved in like making all these different grimoires with all like you know, the th- same three letters at the start of all these pseudonyms. Like, they've absolutely, if this is the upper class using something that the lower classes were using to survive in this world. Um, I'm glad that network exists. Yeah. Well, and it's it's such a good, um, it, it, it is such good, the the thing I like about this is that the the world building of it makes it clear that our two main protagonists are not the first ones with this idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're just without a network themselves. Um, but but they, but it's not that they come in and you know are saving the system or they or breaking society or something like no oh, no. Um, and there's a lot of books that you can walk away with that impression, and this is not one of them. And uh, quite honestly, it makes it feel 
more tangible as a concept. Um, and I really appreciate that. And even like the method they come up with at the end as the solution requires both people to be sorcerers, which is a yeah. thing that is much more likely to be a workable solution for the upper class. Yes. And also, you know, when sorcery appears in these books to be inherited, that I'm um, thinking about how in the long run that's going to have some interesting consequences. But it's not. But they were, you know, it was sorcerers marrying sorcerers anyway, but just, you know, for bad reasons. Yeah. Maybe now it can be a little bit of a good one. Hopefully. Um, Fingers crossed. Yeah. I I really I I like the way it implies it implies all these class concerns and this complexity without making the book be about that. If you liked this style and atmosphere and would like to read this but about classism instead of about sexism then you should read this author's um trilogy which is a different world with similar flavors a similar vibe um which is the uh oh my goodness why did this drop out of my head uh the first book is called Witchmark. um it is the kingston cycle that's what it is yeah so um yeah, when the first book is called Witchmark, and it's the same author, C.L. Polk. Uh, yeah, if you, I, as books, I like that trilogy slightly better than I like the standalone, but I feel like most of that is I like series better than I like standalones. But yeah, anyway, if you want more class commentary, if you wanted this book to have more class commentary, read The Kingston Cycle, because. This author did that, they just did it in another spot. Anyway, that digression over. Um, yeah. Uh, anything else before I move on from the circle? Nah. We mostly get, oh no, oh no, what are you doing here? <laughs> on to Isbita and Alocishet Normativity. So... Uh, she is, they don't have we, the, li we should, we should, uh, preface this that we are not talking about this from, we're mostly focusing on the aloe part of aloe cishet normativity. Yeah. That's what I wanted to clarify. Um, there is some implications that if you are not cis, you also are incredibly discriminated against. Uh, and mm -hmm. we don't actually, so, and there's, there, you can infer that, um, if you are not het heterosexual, that you're also discriminated against. Like, so the the on screen, I assumed it was the other way around. Like, there's the, yeah, yeah, it was. I misspoke. <laughs> it there's clear there's clear evidence that heterosexual that non heterosexuals are discriminated against, and you can infer that non cis people are also discriminated against. But the on screen front and center that we are talking about is that ace arrow people are who we are talking about in context of the book. So we have labeled mm -hmm. this as an overarching label because uh -huh. all of it is implied, but the thing that we are talking about is the allosexual normativity. Yep. I just wanted yeah. to get that out front of our discussion so that nobody is sitting here waiting for it to hear from their own <laughs> the, the, the perspective that matches their identity um yeah so it, they have a thing like you know the the question is brought up well what if if a man has to get married in order to become uh a full sorcerer and like married to a woman specifically married married to a woman with the implication that they have to have children very yes. specifically yeah yeah so this whole this whole system for the upper classes is uh man and woman get married if the woman has magic then she has to be in the collar for a long time um either back to back or in intervals depending on whether she's a chastlander or a lalandrin lalandrin 
I'm not totally sure how to spell that one. Um, or how to say that one. Um, yeah. Uh, if you... Yeah, so in Chastland, it's just literal back-to-back decades. Um, and uh, and then if if a male sorcerer wants to make the great bargain and become, you know, full master of his craft, he has to get married to a woman, even if he has zero interest in women. Uh, and they there is actually a, a brief discussion on that particular point where it's like, well, what if they don't want to? It's like, yeah, just because they're a man. It's like, guess they can just ignore their wife forever. Yeah, like, I guess we can just be, we can be married for all of the social reasons and then never actually, but it's it's implied that a, 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 a not even implied, it's straight out said to one of our main character, two of our main characters, that, Having a good relationship with your spouse is not only not required. It's probably rare. It's not. A, it's kind of assumed that you won't. It's assumed right. that the wife will hate her husband, especially if she's a sorceress. And it's assumed that the husband will just treat his wife as a possession. And that's just the way that they live. Now, to be fair, there are two cultures that are front and center in this book. The one where mm-hmm. the story is taking place in and then one where two of our main characters are from. And where our main characters are from, this is slightly, it is slightly less of a wife is the husband's property situation, but not not that much slightly. It just looks slightly better on paper. <laughs> and then they explore a little bit of how it's like actually not not a good thing. Um, essentially, the the only difference there is that a an unmarried woman um can kind of have her own or women can have their own property in that culture but that doesn't affect like daily life at all daily life she's still just subject to her husband's decisions um yeah so it, it, in a cult in a culture where it's like well your whole entire goal is to have an heir and to be married and you can't achieve like the conclusion of your social upbringing until you've achieved that f- that marriage at the very least it there's no room for ace or arrow characters there's no room for non cis non cis people essentially existing there's no room for non uh het characters to to be um yeah and and, and i should be, we should be clear we're talking about this because we have an ace arrow character and society yep. has told them you can't do this. You can't be this way. You have to yeah. pretend that you actually do want marriage and children with a person. Yeah. Or at least you're. It's going to happen whether or not you want it's it. It's going to happen whether you want it or not. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there's a thing with um, property where because even though she is from um, Lanandris, even though she's from there, uh, if she gets married with a chastland marriage contract then she will lose the property that is in her name from her home country yeah because of where her marriage happens it will get um it'll be uh, absorbed and it'll go under chastland rules of inheritance which do not consider women at all yeah and when we say that there would be no room for trans people in the world of this book. And there is pretty much stated that there's no room for ace and arrow people. And they'd be more concerned about the ace than the arrow uh, of that. Um, The, the book and the author clearly view that as a problem. Like that is one of the central conflicts and it is so well handled. And yeah. one of the things that I love about this book, which um, is part of why I wanted us to talk about this specifically, is that we have an Allo main character who we'll talk about a little more in the next section and an Arrow A secondary character who are working together for the goals of making things be a not like this. Yeah. Mutual benefit, essentially. mm -hmm. Yep. And 
there are several points where the Aloe character, she could be happy with either magic or marriage, potentially. There, there's complicating factors in the book, but like yeah. at its core, she actually does have a choice. Does she want magic or marriage? But for the Arrow Ace character, no, she doesn't want marriage. She doesn't want to ever be pregnant. She's not okay with that. And she just wants to be on her ship and sail around the world and learn stuff and study things and travel. And she ha- she doesn't want to do that with a husband at home and sometimes she's pregnant. No, no. Yeah, no, she, no, she just she wants never what wants she wants and she doesn't want marriage at all. And there's a bit where Bard, who she's known for a long time because he's one of, he's, I think, like her brother's best friend. Yeah. Or very close. At the very least, social, close, societally close, and they spend we a lot of time We are not presented together. in the book with an alternate best friend. Right. At, at least. Right. Um, they traveled together to Chaslin yeah. for bar- bargaining season. Um, you know, he, oh, that's he's that's like, a whole part of this. Bargaining season mm-hmm. is literally women being displayed for the men to court, and then the men approach the women's father and say, "I would like mm-hmm. to buy your your child, please." Like that is how this goes. It's very much that. Oh yeah, yeah. So I'm so used to that as a trope that I. I wasn't thinking about stating that, but yes, they have an entire several month season where like they rent or if they're lucky enough to own their own, great, but a lot of people rent really, really fancy homes uh, so that they have a nice address during bargaining season, e- even if in the case of Beatrice, like they live pretty far away. Um, so with um, Isbita, she is not interested in any solution that involves marriage. Just, just no, not at all. And I, I love that an Aeroasis character's need for a different solution prompts the Aloe character to refuse to settle and not compromise. Well, and and this is something that really stood out to me with this piece. We have this like almost a dichotomy of um from the more repressive constricting society we have at the very least not an aloe ace character a, mm-hmm. a or not a ace arrow character we have an aloe character of some level who has to kind of convince one of the other main characters that this is a problem <laughs> and mm-hmm. that but but she doesn't really understand the ace arrow perspective and then from the slightly less restrictive society we have an ace arrow character who then has to go to this this aloe character and be like hey your compromise is my personal hell (laughs) like like this is not better even if you were okay with it and and it's nice that both main uh, that two out of three of our main characters kind of have this realization of like oh this is a thing even if it doesn't affect me and and it happens twice and one of them is to our main character and it feels very natural it doesn't feel forced and weird like it feels like a a a wake-up call and less like a plot device if that makes sense yeah especially when if marriage happens in the way that her mother is trying to arrange for it to happen she would lose the benefits of having been from Linandris. Yes. Which would just make it worse. Like, currently she owns a ship that she's never gotten to set foot on because if she did, then legally no one could make her do things she didn't want to do. So yeah. they never let her on the ship at all. Um, and she has property. And Beatrice looks at that and says, but you've got it so great. But then is Beta will lose that if she gets married here in Chaslin with the bargaining season. Ah, yeah. I just, the way the book is put together is so good. The way it balances these things and it's in the narrative. I just really love how this is handled. Also, I would say that there's a, like a really cool and pretty succinct, like explanation of, um, how is beta is arrow ace. Like, 
Yeah. Basically, like, you know, describes having aesthetic attraction. Like, I, I liked it a lot. That was nice. Okay, time to talk about misogyny. So. Oh, again? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we've, we've accidentally worked that topic into all of our other topics. I mean, it is like yeah it's it's there kind of the focus of the book like it would be hard to completely avoid mentioning it um okay so just gonna up front say that it would not be it would be extremely appropriate and i feel like it's on purpose if you read this book and you're like so the collar has uh in a bunch of ways is like a magical form of birth control in terms of the negative effects on the people who have the collar um like the the way that like some people have good experiences with hormonal birth control yeah and some people have very bad experiences and feel like they've lost the ability to have any emotions um the the three months i was on depo were horrible and i didn't realize until i got something else and felt like a person again it it was horrendous and just reading this book i was like oh no being colored is like when i was on depo it just it just sounded exactly like that yeah um if you've never had that, um, what's in the book, which overlaps, at least for me personally, with that, it ha- um So the, the colors make colors dimmer. They, like, it messes with their senses or they're not as, like, or at least they can't, like, I don't know if they literally aren't sensing as much or don't feel the positives from what they are sensing, um it's some combination of that with the collars uh and it also makes them not able to like express things or totally feel stuff it's and it with with the book it was like she knew what she wanted to do or what she wanted to say and it was like it was there and she just couldn't get across the gap between wanting to have this reaction and actually externalizing it at all. That's that's kind of how that read to me Yeah. Um, in the book for the bit where she's in the collar. And the reason that they have the collars are um, to st- stop a spirit from getting in and entering um an unborn baby during gestation instead of the baby becoming insold so basically you know it's a fetus in the world of this book it doesn't have a soul yet and then instead of ever getting a soul a spirit takes up residence instead yeah um there's enough evidence in the book that like the spirit born are like actually a thing. This is a real problem. They're not lying about it being a problem. No, Um, but there is a lot of an issue with all of this. (laughs) Yeah. Like we have one culture who's like, well, guess you're going to be in that collar for literal decades. And it is unclear whether you ever get to exit or whether exiting is dependent on class and the whims of your husband. Uh, Well, it's definitely dependent on the whims of your husband. Um, like, we don't have a good, I don't ha- I at least didn't come away from the book with a good sense of whether Beatrice's mother would ever exit the collar. Like, I kind of assumed post-menopause she'd Yeah, and I, I did not have that impression that Robin did. Yeah. Uh, but that's actually, that's kind of a nice thing about this book. There's a couple of world-building things where, like, it's kind of a little bit nebulous, or it's very heavily implied that it is different for commoners or the nobility. Mm-hmm. And... You know, there's that like, well, maybe, but the main character has no hope of this. Like, that's not a thing that she's banking on. It's not a thing anybody ever says to her as like a, 
well, you know, just have children and then you can get this back. Like there's never, that's never said to her in any way, shape or form. And it's never part of her innermost thoughts at all. Yeah. And also with the um, disparity between, so in the book, as we mentioned with the, this, this book not having much room for trans or non-binary people, uh, the, it's speaking completely in terms of men and women um but uh with real world people with uteruses being the ones who are on birth control and uh people who don't um who uh end up equally contributing to people becoming pregnant uh generally speaking even if they want to be on birth control it is difficult or expensive and there's a social stigma. Uh, si- like disparities and side effects, that's like a whole bunch of stuff. We're not here to comment on all the real world, whatever. But the book has like its own kind of version of that sort of massive disparity where like the exact same thing is happening and it is treated as acceptable and necessary in one case and for women and unacceptable or even a punishment for men where being put in the same collars that they make all of their wives and daughters and mothers be in uh being in that collar for a year is used as an extreme punishment for male sorcerers it severs them from their bound spirit um and it it's treated as like stripping of them of their degree in sorcery um and there's this really good line. Um, anyway, there, there's this really good line where uh, when, when Beatrice learns that the thing she's expected to be in for literal decades, a man being in it for a year, is a punishment within the chapter houses. She says that she could spend a very long time be if she sp- if she started thinking about it she could spend a very long time being angry just about this thing where this it this seeming inevitability for her in her future whether or not she even wants to be with anybody that this same thing is a punishment for the men and that they don't seem to see that disconnect is pretty awful yeah, there's a pretty good conversation that she has with Ianthi, our main character. And it, she points this out to him and is basically like, hey, that's pretty terrible. And he is initially a little bit like, what are you talking about? Of course it has to be this way. And then there's a good moment because he goes away, thinks about it, and comes back with, I'm sorry that I didn't make this connection on my own. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it's not... It's not just thank you for pointing out this me or I'm sorry society treated you this way or any. I mean, it is also that. But he says, like, you know, I'm sorry that I I never realized I didn't bother to think about it that much. Yeah. Um, Which is not always a thing. Not always a thing that even if it happens in fiction, it's not always displayed on screen, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, you know, seeing that person come back and go, oh, (laughs) You know, you shouldn't have had to point this out to me because I had all of the pieces. Yeah, that conversation me. was pretty close to, I'm sorry I made you do the emotional labor when I was literally the yeah. one telling you <laughs> all of the facts. Yes. And I didn't put together what they mean in combination, and I'm sorry. Like, it's it's pretty close to that. Like, I, I love the conversations um, in this Uh with Beatrice and Isbita and, and with Ianthe, like, there, there's just, like, a lot of really, really good, like, talking about things and having there be room for them to be wrong or disagree about things and then work through it and work through it in a way that is the person who was actually wrong saying, hey, I'm sorry, I, I, I was wrong, I messed up. Um, like, there, there's this thing, there's this moment in the book where there's a painting um, that they see of uh, the moments like right after a marriage 
and it has like the the groom like super like happy you know like this is you know now like implicit in this is like now he can be a full sorcerer like you know he needed this to advance his career and it has the bride with this just devastated expression and her hand on her neck with the collar that she is now going to be in for decades. And so like Ianthe and Beatrice have been having all of these great conversations or they've had some of them so far and they're going to have more. Uh, Isbita has not been having these conversations with her brother. She just hasn't. And um, she, she makes Beatrice, they like they leave, they leave him there, and Isbita is like, no, we're not. We're just leave. He'll find his own way home because if he asks me what's wrong, I'm going to throw him out of the carriage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, like for that to be her impression is that he would is that like you know his sister assumes he wouldn't get it. To, to me, that implies that there's a lot of emotional growth happening in this book with him um, for, you know, the impression that um, that Isbita has had up to this point is that he wouldn't get it. He would ask questions that to her are inane and insulting. And she just she can't handle that right now. And so she just leaves him. Whereas Beatrice is having all of these conversations, to me that implies that, to me it implies that he has grown recently or is currently doing a lot of emotional growth through this process. Like it shows in the book, like he feels like a, like a different and better person at the end of it because of like confronting his misogyny and assumptions and biases and and how you pointed out that, like, he comes back later and was like, hey, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Like, he he does work outside of the literal conversations they have on the page. Nostalgia is one of the strongest forces in the human psyche and is responsible for the continued existence of some of our favorite fandoms. From the minds behind the Dole Up and Dreams podcast and Isolation Cast Voices from Quarantine, Saturday Morning Confidential takes you on a deep dive into the properties that helped influence the artists and creators of today. So whether you are a Goonie, a Gem Girl, a Digi Destined, or you just want to return to Oz... New episodes release on Fridays bi-weekly starting January 1st of 2021. And join us on the Wednesdays after the main show for the Serial Killer Radio Hour, where we sit down with the people responsible for the toys, shows, and fandoms that you love. Now you can find Saturday Morning Confidential at certainpov.com backslash smcpod or on your favorite podcast platforms. So don't forget to tune in for another deep dive into the files of Saturday Morning Confidential. On to the wrap-up and ratings. For gratuity rating for loss of security. Backstory off-screen, mild, moderate, severe. Um, not off-screen moderate either mild or moderate i think if we had had it from the perspective of the people in that we are talking about uh it would be up higher in the ranking but i think it's either mm-hmm. mild or moderate in the depiction we're shown i i do think it's mild because the reason i think it's mild i think it's, is because I think we, it's fridge horror moderate <laughs> uh, yeah, and mild well, so- as depicted <laughs> Yeah, it's a mild depiction, I think, because they had to have explained, like, no, yeah. if you do this, it will be bad for us. We're not watching the bad happen. Right. Um, so I, I do think mild. But the something that had been written from this group's perspective would be would be a much lot more worse. Much more severe, yeah. Well, yeah. maybe not severe, but more 
more severe. Yeah. For allocyset normativity, uh, there's I think a moderate. lot. Moderate. Yeah, I think moderate. I, I think again, if we had the perspective of a different character, it might kick it up more. But we're kind of given that buffer a little bit. Yeah, yeah, we have someone saying. I don't want these things for these reasons, but they're not listing all of the awful implications that go right. along with those reasons. And we don't have their internal monologue of horror either. <laughs> right. Uh, for misogyny, I think severe, because here we have the character's perspective. Uh, um, I would, s I honestly still think it's moderate because. Oh, okay. So this is not a. This is this is not a depiction of this where the bad thing comes. I think okay. I'm arguing moderate because this character is not being subject to this thing yet. It is a thing that they are being told will happen to them, but insert spoilers here as to why it isn't happening yet. And I think there are a couple of scenes that are pretty severe. But I think yeah, it is. I think scenes. overall, I think overall, the general tone is almost even mild because they kind of tend to reject the thing that is happening consistently with very little, very little actual repercussions in the moment. They're kind of protected by some other factors for part of the story, and mm -hmm. so I think it it kind of blends to a a more moderate reading, like they. There, there's what would have been a graphic and horrifying event that they are told about but do not witness. There's some right. things like that. There's a that. couple of things like that. But I, I think in general, I think if the societal plans had been the plot, mm -hmm. I think it would end up being severe. But I think instead it is a more moderate read because we really have only this one moment that is quickly rectified. Yeah. And, and this character has, again, a lot of I mean, associative things helping them to not mm -hmm. have to face these things, not have to actually right. have them come to fruition. And uh, I think I think it would have been a much more severe story if that had not been true. Yes. Okay. Nope. I can agree with with moderate for that. Um. Uh. Now I should clarify since we called it misogyny as to whether there is literally misogyny i think the literal misogyny in the book is severe yeah um, but, but i, I think our, our topic put, yeah i think our topic right. that we talked about is not quite at that level yes yeah the specific things we talked about but um yeah misogyny is the focus of this book so much so that we talked about misogyny in all three sections and then only one of them got the label so um if you don't want a book where that is the focus, then read something else. But if you're up for that, I, I love this one. It's so good. Um, okay. For integral, interchangeable, or irrelevant, the loss of security. I think it's interchangeable. Uh, yeah. I'm glad it's, I'm yeah, glad it's there, there had to be something. Yeah. But. There were there were a lot of other things. I'm glad it was this thing, <laughs> um, yeah. Which I I talk about in our segment, but I, I agree, definitely interchangeable. It it makes the world be more than upper class people and their servants. Yes, which is very important yes. for it feeling like a real world. But there was a, there could be other ways to get that flavor in, or to get like the literal plot thing yeah. that is accomplished here. Yeah. For Aloe's cishet normativity. I think this is integral. I think the interplay mm -hmm. between... I mean, I'm just going to go ahead and say that I think both Aloe's cishet normativity and misogyny are both integral. I think, And I think their yep. interplay with each other is the plot. <laughs> yes. So yes. You, can't, like, you can't really pull one of these without it even quite changing the other one and how it is portrayed. Mm -hmm. Both in terms of those literal words... And in <laughs> yes. terms of what we talked about under the topics. Yeah, exactly. Them. Yeah. Um, gratuity, not gratuity, our care. care. Um, Loss of security, I think, had a lot of care. I think that was just enough. That was, or, yeah, that was enough care. Or yeah. Yes, I mean, that was yes care. I think, yes, yes. 
our words start being weird and clunky when you use them in a sentence. Um, yeah. Um, Alice's het normativity, I think, was enough. <laughs> I I, yeah. I, I want to say that this might may be a your mileage may vary because if you have if you have real life experiences or are from a culture that still does more like arranged and um like legally required to access your culture's marriages or even if your culture has a history of that and there's still some ramifications in the present day even if it's not technically supposed to be still happening i think this will hit a little bit harder but it being terrible doesn't necessarily have anything to do with I, I would like to argue that I don't think it's just a yes, but I think that the way I, I think the without spoilers, I think the way that the conclusion of the book is handled and also the character growth and development by one of our main characters kicks this to enough for me. I think that it is presented more as a problem and then the problem has people actively looking for it and then the main ending has a legitimately um, not cathartic but like satisfying ending yeah um and i think to me that i would argue for enough because it is a win in a lot of respects i mean i'm kind of emotionally unprepared for how like good the ending is to its characters Uh, right exactly (laughs) you're like wait we had this book and it's not all terrible. Yeah. Really? Like, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Even the second time I was reading it um, for this podcast, I still was like a little bit like, oh, wow. I mean, part of that is because I originally read this in as an advanced copy. So I didn't know if that was going to stay being true oh, in the published gotcha. final. Um, But I, uh, but it it did, and I was like, kind of, I got to have the, oh, wow, it really is this good of an ending, because technically for me, because of literally the slice of time in which I read it, there was this chance that that wasn't going to stay if the author made a different decision. Um, but yeah, like I had this, oh, wow, this is good. So yes, um, so you think enough for the misogyny? I, I think enough. I think... Um... I think if if the things that I've already stated didn't happen, it would definitely be not enough or maybe just straight up no. But I think there is care regarding the characters for each other in the book. There is active aftercare for trauma. There is validation of the fact that the trauma needs to be dealt with. There are There's the potential for systemic change. There's a lot of things happening here and I don't want to go to more in specifics for fear of spoiling but there's a lot of things here that that are very active in the book in context care um and aftercare for events that happen and and i i think for me i think i i would argue enough based off of that okay yeah no that that fits i i do understand the initial fear of like oh no this is going to be bad and then that making it feel more like not enough because you're waiting for it to get worse yeah but my argument is it it didn't get worse worse. (laughs) my argument is it didn't get worse so like Mm -hmm. you know it's fine it 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 ended up much better (laughs) yeah all right point of view uh so for loss of security okay so the the entire book it's beatrice yeah we Um, have a one person point of view for this book Yeah, and since loss of security and the particular angle we took on Alice's cishet normativity were Mm -hmm. focused on characters who are not her, we have not the person affected. But (laughs) for misogyny, we have one of the people affected. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Though I will say, um, just briefly, while we're talking about point of view specifically, um, this does do a good job of conveying that misogyny hurts everyone and is not only bad for the women. Like it's worse for the women, but it is also bad for the men in this book. Yeah. I I'm while well, we're talking about point of view. Like, yeah. You know, absolutely. we do, we don't literally get a guy's point of view, but we get him like 
saying his thoughts and realizing these things. And it, it uh, like, and it, it, it is nice to see that. Uh, it keeps it from being an us versus them situation, um, which I appreciated. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The The back and forth here is very good and very clear and easy to read. Okay. Uh, aspiring writer tip. Um, mm-hmm. Honestly, I, I, I don't remember. We might have had this before, but even just aftercare does not mean doesn't mess up your plot if trauma is your plot like it's okay to mm-hmm. show that on screen uh and i realize like for depending on the genre you're writing in and depending on the length that your book is and the any other possible constrictions you have this might not always be doable depending on your story but um this is book is a very good example of, of again a book that shows the trauma and the aftermath and the aftermath is actually aftercare and not just somebody lying crippled on the floor forever (laughs) like either emotionally or physically literally or like it actually shows like these these the the way that you can actually have a positive outcome um and and not even necessarily because the problem is fixed but like because a character isn't all alone suffering yeah like they're trying to fix the problem. Yeah. But it's not like it is is fixed yeah. when the book ends. And aftercare doesn't always have to come from other people that are suffering in the same way you do. Mm-hmm. Um we have three main characters that kind of all have different things that are going on and and they're all kind of aftercare for each other in a, in different ways. Cool. All right. What All right, so favorite non-traumatic thing about the book. Uh Oh, Isbita um uses he for her ship. No, oh. like it's a it's a tiny thing, but yeah, I, it's just not I, what we're used to. Yeah, and I mean we don't necessarily know if in this world ships are he instead of she, or mm-hmm. if this is Isbita being like, I am a woman who is a captain. Ships are generally. Like what? Whatever. I don't know. Whatever the background rationale was, um, but I I did enjoy that little piece of world building because it's very subtle, uh, but it was nice. Um, I think for mine, I am. I really like. So, I I think I really enjoy. I don't think this is a spoiler. <laughs> I'm not going to get very specific. I really enjoy the communication method. For mm. people who are not people who want to be mages and are not men and don't want to marry. I really enjoy the way that they communicate and I enjoy uh I actually really enjoy um how not very secure it is. <laughs> That's very funny to me. Uh and it's very it it it's just, you know, it's it's very entertaining and it there's another book that we are reading at some point, it's on the list later, that has Almost a similar concept right down to having alternate communication methods. And I think that this book did a better, funnier job of portraying it. Not necessarily that it was as complicated or whatever, but as far as like getting across to the audience what was happening, I think this book did a better job and in very fu- a very funny way. Yeah. And I, I appreciated it. It's one of those things that I like about the other book, too. And so having it prop up again in another book just makes me happy, especially when they do a good job. Yeah. All right. So that's it for the Midnight Bargain. And uh, again, if you liked this book or the world building in here and you would like the classism version of a similar (laughs) setting. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the misogyny version. classism is more your flavor. (laughs) Yeah, if classism instead of sexism is more your flavor, uh, check out The Kingston Cycle, also by this author, C.L. Polk. Uh, the first book is Witchmark. So I, I, I just, I, I've loved everything I've read by them so far, which is this and The Kingston Cycle, and it's great. So, um, and we will catch you in a fortnight.
All music used in this podcast was created by Nicole as Heartbeat Art Co. and is used with permission. Our transcriptionist is Heather. Follow her on Twitter at MamaDragon20. We're proud members of the Certain Point of View Network. Find all the CPOV shows at www.certainpov.com. You can contact us on Twitter at Books That Burn or by email at Books That Burn at Yahoo.com. Please consider leaving us a tip at Kofi.com slash Books That Burn or becoming a monthly supporter on Patreon.com slash books that burn all patrons get access to our upcoming book list bonus content including the second half of all interviews and will receive a one-time shout out to get updates on our written reviews recent episodes and newly completed transcripts subscribe to our fortnightly newsletter at buttondown.email slash books that burn you can find us on apple Podcasts, pandora spotify or wherever you get your podcasts please leave us a review wherever you're listening this helps people to find the show thanks for listening we'll be back in two weeks